second, maybe you can help me with this, with uh, LGBTQ. If gender's non-binary, what do we do with the B? The B? Yeah, bisexual. <laughs> uh. All right, very special episode uh, here today. I know, I know, I, I was just off air. She's going, I can see him, I can't hear him, because since this is our first meeting, mm -hmm. and I know we've disagreed on issues in the past, and I think we agree on some issues now, I figured, well, let's go right into it. You can follow her on Twitter at GoGreen18. Of course, you probably know her YouTube channel, uh, Lacey Green TV. Ms. Green, thank you for being here. Hi, Steven. Hi, how are how you? How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm very good. Yeah, okay. well, you, 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 this, this doesn't need to be awkward or weird. I know you've met a ton of, uh, of uh, more right-leaning people now, and I think I just heard you speaking with uh, Mr. Ray Gunn over there, who's uh, uh, a little bit uh, in the center. Yeah, my boyfriend. I wouldn't describe him as center, but... okay. You know, whatever. <laughs> Funny shit. Uh, but I'm glad we finally have you on the show. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Um, sure. It was one that was really requested by a lot of fans. By the way, not to be confused for those looking at the plugs with Glozell Green. No. Noted. Oh, oh Lord, no. Lacey Green noted. I mean, well, no, no, no. I we don't want to like shortchange. It's a little obvious. <laughs> you never know if they search it. You know, uh, noted feminist and uh, actually has a we'll lot of. Won't find Lacey Green in a bathtub full of Fruit Loops. Full of Fruit Loops. Probably I not. Mean, you never know. You never Maybe, know. You know, there's a bright YouTube future ahead where I'm bathing in cereal. You can just make it a Patreon bonus. If someone pays enough, they can watch <laughs> you bathe in Fruit Loops and apply chaps. And there would be someone who would do that. I guarantee you. Yeah, make the, the dollar absolute dollars. state of things, right there. Uh, well, let me let me ask this. It was really requested by a lot of fans. Um, you were a noted feminist. I think we did even some rebuttals a long time ago. Don't hold it against us with some of your your videos that were very popular. And uh, then you you mentioned you know, taking the red pill. And obviously this has been documented. A lot of people are familiar with it, but for people who aren't, can you kind of set it up and explain to them, what, what does that mean for, for Lacey Green? What was that journey like? Um, well, I was, that video was mostly just me saying that I was willing to talk to people who consider themselves red pillars. I would not call myself a, a red pillar right. in any way, but um, yeah, I, have always really, you know, I come from a really conservative background. I have family members that voted for Trump and they're very religious and they live in the middle of nowhere. You know, I am not like a insulated liberal in any sense of the word. And I yeah. started talking about some of these things on my YouTube channel and how important it is to just sort of like sit down, have a beer, have a chat with people who see things differently than you and to really understand where other people are coming from. And I think everyone should do that. And we should all be open to changing our minds about the things that we believe and learning more and, and growing. So I made this video, you know, just not really thinking much of it that I was going to. Um, oh, that's, you know, a have that's a mistake on the YouTube. Like, well, yeah, yeah. Well, it, I've, there were lessons learned. <laughs> yes, exactly. especially, <laughs> namely, don't read the comment section. But I appreciate well, the, yeah. the chutzpah that, that it took to do that anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I, I got a lot of flack for that and continue to, but whatever. You know, I'm not... I'm not why, though? To... I don't understand why. I mean, what you just said right now, what you just expressed, seems entirely reasonable. That's something that we believe on this program. We have an open invitation to anyone and we will allow them a platform to speak. I can't understand why it would be polarizing. Right. How How is that... What kind of flack do you get for that? Um, I think people from across the spectrum who just have really hyper-partisan opinions feel that, you know, what, regardless of where they're coming from on the political spectrum, feel that talking, being willing, being willing to listen to someone else and try to hear them out and understand them is sort of like conceding how you see things or like agreeing with them. Right. And maybe I just communicated it poorly or maybe people are just so polarized and tribalistic online that it just sort of created this spiraling frenzy. But it's stupid. Right. Well, I mean, well, it's really idiotic, you know? Yes, it, it obviously is. Um, you say across the spectrum. So I, I know you mentioned you've talked about how people on the left, feminists, sort of thought you were a turncoat and you had had uh, death threats against you. I had heard about your story in a parking lot because you had accidentally used the word tranny when quoting Chris Crocker, who used it himself, and they said you led to the deaths of 
I don't. This okay. is this. Is, people go watch her videos. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not hurling mud. Lacey has talked about it. if it sounds absurd. It, 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 it sounds absurd to me as well. But what kind of flack would you get? You know, across the spectrum on on the right for saying, "Hey, let's have a conversation." How how are they mad about that? Um, a lot of people saw me as trying to like just do it for views or accusing me of trying to trick them or, you know, not being willing to have the conversation themselves because they felt that I had hurt them in some crazy way. You know, like you've done so much damage. There's no way, you know, anybody on our side should talk to you. And it's just people are just crazy across the board. Like everyone just needs to chill out, you know, just have a conversation. It's, you know, I, I think the part of it, though, was maybe like I didn't see the videos you made to me, but like some people made some videos that I would say were pretty inflammatory and closed minded themselves. Ours and... probably were. You needn't watch them, but that's the majority <laughs> of <our> videos. <laughs> OK, cool. Well, noted. Um, you know, I think that that sort of attracts a t the type of person who isn't really open to um, having conversations or learning more. They just want to hear things that reinforce their own worldview. You know? Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you. And we talk a lot about, you know, I worked at Fox News for four and a half years before I founded this. Oh, no it way. Like, yeah, it was cool. not not a fun experience. No, not very cool. As a matter, I think it's the opposite of cool. When at commercial yeah. break and I'm on a panel, they're selling self-lubricating pocket catheters. I don't think of it. I can't think of anything less cool than that, Lacey. Walk, but in, <laughs> walk in bathtubs. Yeah, I, I appreciate you patronizing oh, me. Um, so, you know, I, I will say, though, having been, you know, I was raised in a socialist province. Uh, mm -hmm. Quebec. Uh, there is no conservative. There's liberal and liberal separatists. So like you, I was not raised in a in a far right insular bubble. There was no right wing. It didn't exist. I came to the United States to learn about it. Um, that being said, I've definitely, in my experience, having been in Quebec and been here and with, with speech laws in place like Canada, which much more closely mimic Europe, I've really seen the right here to be more open to a, to a dialogue. Um, this, as a matter of fact, you're kind of a rarity for people on the left. Many of them won't come on the show. Many of them don't have conversations at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that is an interesting thing. I, I, so I don't know, like I can't, I don't like making generalizations, but I feel like maybe this is something that is being exacerbated online. Because most of the people that I'm friends with, like in the, in the real world, are down to have a conversation. But one thing that I've noticed happens online a lot in on the left is people have this idea kind of like what i was talking about before right where if you talk to somebody who has views that you believe are abhorrent or hurtful or harmful or whatever that that is giving them power it's giving them a platform um this is what all of the feminist youtubers sort of disowned me over right they said that i was like empowering yeah the right or whatever, like empowering the people that I disagree with by by simply talking to them. Right. And and not only is there there that idea, but anybody even, you know, like myself or anybody who doesn't really see it that way, their fans will come after them. Right. right. So there's like this huge risk that you take and nobody wants to, you know, piss off their fans. So yeah, I understand. Now we've I've seen a small portion of that. For example, um, we've talked about I don't agree with Alex Jones on on much of anything, but I've done his show several times. His son's a fan, and his son, you know, I've given him merchandise, and I've been on his show and told him that I disagree with him. Some conservatives have said, "Well, you're you're enabling some of his conspiratorial views," and I'm like, right. you know, what? I'm pretty clear. I mean, I've been on MSNBC and BBC and Sky News. That being said, it was a very very small percentage uh, of people. It seems in comparison to the reaction to you from feminists where what you're what you're saying isn't that inflammatory that's the thing to yeah me that's i don't like, i don't think so but some people do and they still give me you know still post about me every day which is like what are you doing yeah <laughs> don't you have, i mean to me it's like if you have if there are real problems in the world and real problems in your life why are you obsessing over what people on the like random ass people on the internet do that doesn't really have like much Right. Effect on the world. Yes. That's and weird I, to me. And I do think a lot of people, they're focused on that. And that's why when we do this show, we've, we've always tried to focus on, for example, if I disagree, I don't want a straw man. We, we use clips and quotes and policy from Bernie and Hillary and Young Turks. And we say, here are the mainstream views that we disagree with, because anyone can find the Westboro Baptist Church and sure. act as though they're more than 14 members with flippers, you know, who are sure. inbred. Um, sure. And the same thing on the left. But, you know, there's some mainstream views for me as a conservative on the, red, uh, on the left that I find disconcerting. Let me, I you said you wouldn't consider yourself a red pillar. I understand that. Yeah. Um, it sounds to me like the main thing that's changed 
is your view on having a conversation, maybe maybe freedom of speech, open dialogue a little more. Is that kind of the, really, when you say it was red-pilled, that's the fundamental difference between pre-2017 Lacey Green and post? Yeah, I think that's uh, uh, the main thing. But also, I, I sympathize and understand some of the criticisms of the feminist movement okay. um, that are made online. And I agree with a lot of them. So maybe that's, if you want to call that red pill, you know, I, I think there are. We don't like need any more air problems. quotes. I think people get the picture. If, if someone's already condemned you, know you for I mean? being on the yeah. show, I understand. It's like, it's like conservatives, like, not a Nazi, not a Nazi. <laughs> I heard but the I, audio only version. Yeah, yeah. Probably a Nazi. <laughs> Probably a Nazi. Not a Nazi, but I think, I think school vouchers might be good. He's a Nazi. I knew it. <laughs> um, so then let me ask you this. You say sympathize. What would be different? What views would you say have changed in, in pre-2017 Lacey Green and, and, and post? So you say sympathize. Let's, let's start with that. Um, oh, well, just with, you know, I, I have always thought this stuff and I've talked about it online many times because I myself have been victim of really uh, vitriolic mob attacks online yeah. many times. So, you know, I've always growing up on the Internet and being someone who just kind of like shares their opinions online, have seen the dark underbelly of the the movements that I am aligned with. And I, I feel like I've just seen all the dark yeah. underbellies because you're on the internet so much and that's your job and it's pretty horrible. But yeah, I, uh, I would say the main thing is just feeling like there are some aspects of the feminist movement that are just really toxic, that have been really toxic to me, that have been really toxic to people that I know. And you know, I, I have always felt that way and sort of talked about it and was kind of scared to mm -hmm. poke the beast but now I really don't give a f because I, I really think that there has been a tipping point where it has become so toxic that it's actually hurting the very causes that I believe in. Okay. Uh, what elements, I guess, would you say to when you say toxic of, of feminism specifically? Um, yeah, well, there's a lot of things, but I think one of them, for instance, is like the, mo the, the hate mobs when somebody says or does something problematic, you know, that, that is deemed not like- There's the, the air quotes for those listening audio. She's doing it again. She's doing it again. <laughs> People well, listen to audio sometimes and they go like, why did you? I'm like, no, 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 you missed it. So, okay, I just, but I appreciate it. Consciously, but you know, I, because I hate that word problematic. Like, what is that? I don't even, I don't know. That's, a, on that's, the ground. A, that's a change because you used to use that word. Um, I always use that word in sort of ironic sense. And if you okay. like go back and watch my MTV videos, people didn't really pick up that I was kind of making fun of it. They thought I was serious because, you know, I guess that's a legitimate mistake to make it's sort of a but feminist tony clifton you played them and that's that's okay i respect a little, that a little bit but i also yeah i also just think people get so like hyped up about words like triggered or problematic it's right. like everyone just you know it's like a buzzword that people lose their minds at but yeah th this coming back to what i was saying sure. just, just this idea that like if you do or say something that is deemed problematic you are now a horrible person who deserves to die and lose your job and you you caused all this terrible stuff you know you're you're responsible for the violence against all these people just for like maybe having kind of an ignorant or um different even opinion about mm -hmm. something and i think that's a really toxic mentality that makes it so that people can't actually have a conversation about things no. and they can't actually hear each other um or respect each other because nobody is going to be this like image of ideological purity. There's all these purity tests, right? And and as soon as you've been deemed not pure enough for the left, you're just done. They'll throw you in the trash. And one one thing that I like and align uh, with some of my more moderate to right-leaning friends is this idea that we're still human beings and, and we should still be able to like see through our differences mm -hmm. and work through them in a uh, a respectful way, you yeah. know, and I, I really value loyalty. I'm a very loyal person and I find more of my, like politically, I find more of my moderate to right leaning friends are at the end of the day, even if they think I'm like a crazy nut job liberal or whatever, right? they aren't going to just up and leave me and, you know, stop talking to me like many of my liberal friends have. You know, I, I've never been abandoned by my right wing friends over my views, but yeah. left wing. Absolutely. That is in, that is interesting. You know, I uh, I guess I never really thought of it. But I, having had left wing friends like Sally Cohn on the show and when people kind of doggy piled on her, I try to say, listen, I disagree with her, but she's a very decent human being. Um, yeah. That being no, you know what? You're absolutely right. Now that I go back, all my left wing friends from Montreal, none of them like me anymore. They all hate me. Then again, they might have just been looking for an excuse. So um, if you look at <laughs> many do. Um, 
how would we say, so some things you talked about quite a bit, uh, since I have you here and you talk about sort of respectfully either finding common ground or disagreement, like toxic mm -hmm. masculinity you talked about quite a bit, and it seems as though you've transitioned a little bit, certainly in your explanation of, of uh, how it's often perceived or described. Yeah. How would you sure. describe your view then and now if it's, if it's changed? Um, I don't think it's really ever changed. I have always felt that there are elements of how we raise girls and how we raise boys um, those gender roles that we, you know, uphold so highly in our culture, that there are some roles for boys and girls that are hurtful to them and can be toxic to others. Okay. And when we're talking about toxic masculinity, I think in particular, one of the big issues is telling boys to suppress their feelings and to deal with their upset and their emotions with violence. You know, I think that men should be able to express their feelings. And when we shame them and call them pussies and being a, a little girl or whatever for having feelings, that that is a really f***ed up thing to do to a human being. Yeah. Because men are humans, too, and they're going to have feelings sometimes, you know? Sure. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't think anyone would disagree with that, though. Um, I think what exactly. I would disagree with is the presupposition <laughs> that society tells young men to deal with their emotions through violence. Uh, you know, that's where I would say, you know, bi biologically, young boys tend to be more aggressive. Young boys tend to be more hands on, more rambunctious. And a lot of them are frustrated because we put them in a public education system, which is designed for women, not young boys. Um, and we tell them not to be not only not to be violent, but sometimes not to be young boys, which is a bit rough and tumble. Um, so I, yeah, I, I think I think, you know, I, I will. I agree with you that boys because of testosterone and you know that's a generalization but in general they do have a lot of aggressive energy or a lot of energy in general and that's why i think that we need to have positive outlets for boys like you know i think sports is a great great outlet for people's energy and girls have that energy too sometimes you know it really just depends but um, sports and c healthy competitions ways to get that energy out in healthy ways that doesn't hurt people. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's ever this message that like, well, sometimes there is, but usually it's not like you should go out and beat someone up, but sometimes it is. Sometimes it's like, oh, you're having a problem with someone at school. You should like show them who's boss. You know, you should f take them down and not put up with their crap because that's how you show that you have self-respect as a man. And I think that that is like not a very productive thing to tell boys. My dad told my little brother this all the time. Like you should just, you know, beat him up. And I'm like, maybe not though. Yeah, <laughs> maybe well, you I was going to say, I've go never heard that at, that you have problems with. Yeah, I've never, ever heard that in my I, I, I wonder how much with with, I guess, sort of modern third wave feminism is this perceived societal conditioning versus what's happening in actuality? Because if you look at any public school, any uh, public program, any intramural sports, they punish severely any outbursts of violence. And I've never heard anyone personally tell a young boy to be violent. I've heard them say, defend yourself. My dad told yeah. me that. Um, and, I almost think that telling young boys they shouldn't be the way that they are uh, with checks and balances is more toxic than trying to create outlets that maybe aren't the most uh, conducive toward actually, like you said, sort of expending some of this, this aggressive testosterone laden energy. Well, I don't think that anybody, I mean, I think for one thing, intramural sports is different than how boys and girls are socialized. Like there's no doubt about it that we do tell, sure. and there's there's a lot of data to back this up, that we do feel more comfortable with boys be expressing their emotions physically and solving problems physically. And you see this in the movies everywhere. Like, you know, you see this at bars and at schools and, you know, there's just sort of this idea that if you're a guy who has self-respect, you know, you should stand up for yourself and the way you stand up for yourself may include physical violence sometimes. And um, I, I think that this, uh, this message can also come out in relationships because, you know, we have a real abuse problem in a lot of teen relationships. You know, I don't know what the statistic is, but any, any amount is too much, right, of, of abuse. And it's not just yeah. physical abuse, like men and women abuse each other in different ways. Men are more likely to be physically violent. Women are more likely to be emotionally, psychologically abusive. Yeah. So we, we, maybe part of that is like our biological nature as males and females, but I do think the message is reinforced socially. I, I guess this is where I'm, where do you think it's reinforced socially for men to be physically abusive to women? 
Well, no, not to, that's not what I said. Well, you said in relationships. So you said the, some of these ideas are reinforced socially and men are more physically abusive and teen I women said, are more. Yeah, I mean, what I mean is like the, this idea that men, it's acceptable for men to handle their problems with violence and physicality is mm -hmm. something that we see not only in solving interpersonal problems between other men, but in their relationships as well. We don't really teach people how to deal with their emotions and how to have healthy communication so that they can deal with these aspects of being human in a healthy way. Yeah, I, I respectfully, I would disagree there. I think young boys are physical in nature, and I think that's separate, right, because this is biology versus uh, a behavior in acting out violently toward another person. I think one is innate. And I think one is something that's not so sociological. So you condition. think it's innate to like beat people up at school? No, <laughs> I, mean, I think, but I think young a, men are more. I think young men are much more physical. I think young boys have much more, as you said, physical energy. And I think we sit them, for example, in a classroom for eight hours a day, where young women tend to thrive, listening, verbally communicative, and young men get frustrated. Uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with teaching men how to. Uh, I mean, we hear it all the time now, exercising, how to physically express themselves, how to have proper outlets. I think it's a good thing, but then I also don't think that socially, I, I don't think we encourage men to be violent in toxic ways. Well, I think, I think that's, you know, I disagree. I think that's everywhere in the media. So, and there's a lot of data to back that up. You know, there are a lot of socialized messages about violence. So, disagree that, there. That, that men should be violent. Not that they should be violent, but that it is an acceptable way to handle your feelings. Okay. Um, well, right now we're, hand we're handling any disagreements through words and found a lot of common ground. I mean, uh, we can fight it out, Stephen. Let's go. You, wanna get, no, you don't want to go <laughs> physically because then, then the biology comes into play, um, which brings us kind of in. So what other aspects, I guess, of, of toxic masculinity? And again, I think the reason this is important and I understand that you sympathize with it. I think you see this point of view is that young men who've been vilified for what they are. Right for being men, uh, and then it being referred to as toxic masculinity, then you know, then you end up with a rebound effect. Then you end up with you know the sexodus, uh, second adolescence. We're seeing these results right now with young men who are afraid of relationships. Um, what other aspects do you think that maybe we we could improve with with men and women as far as how we socialize them? Um, well, I think that men are also you know the way that we talk about relationships is often in a, in a very entitled way. And you see this across the board with this idea that, you know, if if you're good to someone or if you're nice to someone, then they should like you and they should want to have sex with you. And I see this not just amongst men, by the way, I see this in a lot of different, it comes out in a lot of different ways in yeah. different communities, this entitlement to sex, yeah. entitlement to relationships or feeling like, you know, if nobody likes you, that is their problem when really maybe you just maybe you're aren't a, a likable person. Yeah. 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 Hence why I lost yeah. all my friends in Montreal. But they're also socialists, so I don't really care. Um, no, I, I agree with you on that. I think particularly this sort of alpha uh, male fake pickup culture. I think is a real problem. Yeah. And, and I wrote about as a traditionalist, you know, uh, Christian conservative sort of complementarian about waiting until I was married. And I was mm -hmm. rigged through the mud by none other than Amy Schumer, no less, uh, talking about how that was a terrible sort of antiquated view. Uh, and uh, for wanting to wait? For wanting to wait and expressing that I thought there were a lot of benefits to it and that many people would actually uh, probably do well to consider the same option. Um, and a big part of that is obviously a big part of women's lib and, and, and the feminist movement, sexual liberation. So do you think mm -hmm. that maybe it's it's gone too far that way? Because I think that exists quite a bit on the feminist side as well, uh, the hypersexualization that you're, you're kind of a failure if you don't act in a predatory way sexually like men. Right, like this idea that if you're not getting laid, there's something wrong with you because sex is so freely available now. So what's the issue, right? Yeah. Um, or, yeah, or, or that I, women and men hand, handle sex differently. You know, I read a lot of, like, if you read a lot of these women's magazines, it's far worse than Playboy or Penthouse Letters at this point. You read Cosmopolitan, <laughs> it's acting like women are, are men and out there uh, being sexual predators in the way men are hardwired. And, and that seems right. to me like something that's, uh, like you said, it's, 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 it's a purity test. It's, do you have a like an example of, of sure that? how to pick how to pick up uh, how to pick up uh, guys at the bar um, how to you know ten different ways to please a man and every every single cover is 
basically right, acting as a yeah. women are walking sex pots who are as yeah, interested in I, spreading I think... their seed in the way men are biologically hardwired to do doesn't mean it's right. I think men need to curb their biological urges. Uh, but it seems as though feminism runs counter to the, 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 the essence of men and women. Well, I don't think there's like a, a I don't like essentializing men or women, you okay. know, and it, like, I, I don't think we should boil uh, people, these huge groups of people down to some essential nature. I think that's a little bit very reductive. But yeah, I think that there is. It, um, it is it is reductive in the sense that men, and, and I think this is, it, I just want to answer that. It is reductive. Men and women are different. Men are more sexually predatory. Women are not by their nature. I'm okay with that reduction. Now, that being said, I don't see people as nothing but Black Lives Matter, nothing but LGBTQ. After that, you're a male, you're a female. There's a certain biological constraint there. Be what you want to be. But I'm, I'm okay with being reductive and saying men and women are, are different in that sense. Well, men and women are different partially because of our biology, yeah. you know, males and females, and partially because of how we're, we're socialized. Of course. So, yeah, I think there are differences between men and women. Absolutely. Um, I just think the differences are sometimes overstated. They're, they're more... Um, hyped up, we, we are very hyper-focused on how we're different when actually there are a lot of things about us that are the same. For instance, women like to get laid too. Women love having sex. So, you know, most women. And I can't speak for all women because that would be too reductive. Yeah. But, you but know, mo the most idea women, that, most that... women have, most women like to get laid in the, in the constraints, not all women, in the constraints of an emotional connection, a relationship, whereas a guy can have sex with five people in a row, many guys, not all guys. That's why you see the pickup culture on the male side and not in the female side. They don't have the same emotional, um, uh, emotional hardwiring sexually that, that women do as a general rule. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that statement. I think that's reductive. But um, in general, in general, I think it's true that by some com combination of biology and how we're socialized, that ends up being how the majority of people um, who are men and women experience it. But, you know, I don't think that there's any sort of like innate sort of like part of being a male that makes you this creepy, douchey pickup artist type, you know, like that, that's a combination of maybe some sort yeah, of sexual is. drive plus being an Yes. You know, and, and men are not uh, men are not assholes. so this idea that, well, all men are just sort of these creepy, predatory guys just waiting to come out. I, I strongly disagree with that. Men I didn't say that, though, but I do say that men men can be married in the long term. Go there goes another one. Men are hardwired to spread their seed and they want they want to be as promiscuous as possible if left to their own devices without a moral constraint. Women aren't designed the same way. Women biologically don't necessarily. That's why the, the, the stereotype is the cad, to use the old terms, and then the nag, the cad and the nag. The woman refuses sex or uses it as a manipulation tool, like you said, a ma manipulation, more emotional abuse, whereas the men are more physical. That applies sexually as well. And I think that's important to recognize because if we're going to teach and fix some of these problems and find what makes us the same, teaching young men how to be upstanding men, husbands, uh, fathers, is, is the most important thing of all. And, and same thing with, with women. Yeah, well, like I said, I disagree with your diagnosis of all men and all women as these super reductive categories. But yes, I do think that we should teach men and women how to function successfully and healthfully in their relationships so they can have fulfilling lives. Yeah, well, I think I think an example is Amy Schumer to go back. The reason that that's shocking is because it's rare. Right. The reason um, that like, might... like the idea of a woman wanting to sleep around. Yes. Or what? Yeah. Um, I think it's probably more rare for a number of different reasons, maybe partially biological, partially it's been socially unacceptable for women to be sexual, although that's changing. And maybe that's why you're seeing more of this stuff that you describe as male behavior. Um, but I didn't describe yeah, it as male behavior, I though. I separated behavior versus biological urges. I think there's a really strong, uh, there needs to be an importance on curbing biological urges we are not just determined by our urges or by our desires or by our carnal yeah, the ones that are harmful ones. to others yes the, exactly the, the stuff that's harmful to others right or to ourselves um yeah those should probably be curbed and we can and do curb them but that's what i'm saying with like the toxicity stuff is sort of the the ways that we make excuses for people to not curb those um impulses or to not curb those learned behaviors yeah.
Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I think what we're, where we're kind of disagreeing and missing each other here is I think a lot of young men have been told to curb it in a way that's unnatural and, and unhealthy. Like you would say, you know, hiding emotions. That's a very new thing. I've talked about this. If you go back to mm -hmm. Lincoln, Roosevelt, this idea that you are a jock or you are an artist or you are an intellectual, that's a very new idea. You were, the term I've talked about this was actually jack of all trades, master of one. And the mocking of it became the colloquialism master of none. The truth is you weren't considered a well-rounded man unless you were all of these things. Um, and it was perfectly fine to cry, to hug another man, to kiss another man. Uh, so I think that's where people definitely have gone a, a, astray. But I also think that in addition to that, I think feminism has really put a lot of burdens on, on young men. And that's why you see a rejection of it, to really stop being young men. We have an education system that's based for, for, for young women. Uh, if you look at the way right now, Hollywood is, is uh, reacting to things that we would agree, you know, the Me Too movement. Uh, mm -hmm. The reaction is one that assumes that of guilt, right? And so a lot of young men feel browbeaten for being men, is, is my point. And the, the biology is an important component that needs to be acknowledged. And rather than say, hey, you shouldn't be so rambunctious, let's sit you in a classroom, we should say, all right, young men are rambunctious. How do we channel that positively? Well, I think you, that young men need to learn how to function in the world and to be disciplined and... Um, you know, you, you need to learn to have respect for yourself and the environment around you. And I think that's the thing men should learn as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and same thing with, with women. And like you said, across the board, there can be toxic masculinity, femininity. It, it goes both ways. Um, so let me ask you how this, how this ties into, uh, because I know you've, you've also taken flack, like you said, from the transgender community, I think needlessly uh, for delineating between biology and gender. Um, have your mm -hmm. views on that changed at all since the quotes again for people who aren't who are listening audio red pilling or are they fundamentally the the same? Um, I, I guess I should ask you what you would say the same is like what's your well I know that you've talked about how uh, gen, uh, sex is biological and that yeah. gender is a social construct um, yes. is how you presented it a long time ago but I also know that you I think rightfully talked about how there's a lot of pseudoscience on LGBTQ AIP blogs that talk about a male brain and a female brain yeah. and transgenderism. Um, I, this is one thing, maybe you can help me with this, with uh, LGBTQ, a, I think that's LGBTQ, some people add AIP. Um, if gender's non-binary, what do we do with the B? The B? Yeah, bisexual. <laughs> uh I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, this is you this mean, you mean like if bisexual means there's gender, two. Oh, right, right. That's well, problematic bisexual... to use that word. Right, right. <laughs> okay, I think it's a, see what you're saying. Bisexual, well, at least in the research, refers to sex, right? So male and female. Um, whereas gender would be a different, like the non-binary designation refers more to how people interpret their sex in the world, okay. not necessarily about genitals you know, more about how you, the masculine or feminine uh, or androgynous energies. But then the acronym makes like no energy. sense because you have, you have one that's biology, bisexual, and then transgender, which is gender societal. They've got to change the whole acronym. <laughs> well, some people have made the criticism that um, sexuality or sexual orientation and uh, gender identity are two very different issues. Mm -hmm. And so they shouldn't be on the same acronym. I disagree with that because I think they all kind of fall under, they all uh, have a lot of shared, uh, shared traits and shared struggles mm -hmm. um, that all fall under the, anybody who doesn't have a normative, you know, main, uh, just a conventional, what we consider a mainstream sexuality or, or gender identity, you know? So those things have have shared um, characteristics. Okay, so- But yeah, they're different. They are different. Yeah, well, bisexual would be sexual, so it's basically someone who's attracted to a male or female biologically versus yeah. gender. So a bisexual could be attracted to a male biologically who identifies as, your guess is as good as mine at this any, point. Any gender they identify, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's one thing I think that, uh, you know, people on the right have had, and, and, and since you, you talk so much on sexuality and, and, and gender, you know, how many genders are there? Uh, how many pronouns are there? What do we, what do, we do yeah. so since it's a societal issue, what do we do yeah. societally to deal with this? How many can be put in a driver's license? What do we do with voter registration? It's an mm. ever-changing rule book. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? I, I, th two? I think Only that, two? Yes. Only two camps? Yeah. I do. 
Um, well, I think there are practicalities to that view. Um, however, I also think that there, you know, a lot of people just experience themselves and the world differently, and they want language to describe their experience and their identity. And, you know, I think that's a positive thing. It doesn't hurt me. It doesn't hurt anyone else. I think the question of like driver's licenses and stuff or what kinds of laws should govern, you know, sex specific spaces, things like that. Yeah, there's complicated issues that we'll have to mesh out and figure out how to make it work. But just in terms of how people, what pronouns they want to use or how they want to describe themselves, I don't give a shit. Live your life. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't think anyone here does either. Um, but that's why Jordan, someone like Jordan Peterson, is so pro uh, popular because we're well past that, and now we're at the point of compelled language, you know, in Canada with uh, Bill there, and we have it in New York where landlords can't use the wrong pronouns for fear of being sued. So, so we are past it. It is a legal issue now. It is a political issue now. But, it is a like, rights when issue. is that? When has anyone ever like? I I see what you're saying. Well, C16. I think Jordan Peterson just really, really. Uh, misrepresented that bill. I read the bill. I read all of the legal language. I did not see what he was saying in any of the language of that bill. And, you know, I understand the, the sort of, what's the name, like the, a snowball effect, right? Yes. <laughs> where, I'm like still waking up this morning. Oh, that's where, fine. uh, you know, where, where someone, you, you, oh, well now we've opened the door to this and what next? And people said that about same sex marriage too. Like, oh, you can marry a man. Now you're going to marry your dog or whatever yeah well i think you know, that's a right I, I think it's a valid argument just saying it is not an what I, do we I do now with what, what about the males dominating young girls sports now in high school transgenders whether it's wrestling or track you know what about people who've been jailed uh in canada for using for for engaging in what they consider hate speech we've had them on the show from people who run bed and breakfast people who went to jail for yeah for yeah in, ca in canada for hate speech what what was defined? What is what was the hate speech? <laughs> that's the problem. So that's a problem. Either hate what speech exists it? or it doesn't. One of them, Mike Ward, was actually put for a human rights tribunal and uh, uh, fined, and now that's being on appeal. So he's the one who's been on the show most recently. Uh, he made a joke about a kid with a disability who was on Make a Wish and was on effectively the the Canadian version of American Idol, and he made a joke that was deemed offensive and was put before mm. a human rights tribunal and accused of hate speech. Stephen Boisson uh, was a pastor who spoke out and said, I'll never marry two men. This is the religious view of marriage. That man was fined and I believe served jail. It happens all the time. Just um, for saying that? Yes. Okay, well, if that yeah. is indeed what happened. And that's what the bill, and that's what the bill emboldened. I would want to fact check myself, but if that is indeed what happened, that is messed up. And I don't, I don't agree that you know, I support freedom of speech. People should be able to say whatever they want, including hate speech, right. which is, um, you know, I am anti-hate speech, but I think that there's a, a tricky problem with trying to restrict people's speech in any way and the subjective lines around what is considered hateful. Um, the only line that I draw really is when you're inciting violence. Sure. I don't think that that is protected speech. So, you know, no, it's not. We agree. Philosophically, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, if if this became a huge problem in the United States, I might have more sympathy for that argument. But you know, as it stands it right now, nobody's being sued for using the pro the wrong pronouns or yes, whatever. They are. And who? Landlords in New York to start with. Can you give me some names? Because like I haven't heard of that, and I'm pretty. Well, I just gave you two, and if I keep giving you names and facts, and you Canada. say I don't believe you, you're doing the Naomi Wolf, and then you have to fact check you it's afterwards. In Canada. So this is in New York, it's yeah. Landlords in New York. We've written about it on the site extensively. Um, you have plenty of professors who've gotten in trouble, obviously, for for improper language. Um, I mean, I can't give you every single so single name, but uh, I've just given you a handful. So it's asking for one landlord, Stephen. You're saying landlords. What's the law? Are being it's the law. Sued. Yeah, it's the law. The law so the law in New York is as I know, okay, is that you About have to have bathrooms for, what is it, bathrooms for like a, a lot of genders, right, like 20 or 30 or something, um, at your place of business. Yeah, no, I'm talking about landlords and misgendering. So there are laws now about misgendering. And the reason we come back to the point is why it's important. I think maybe the fundamental issue here, maybe you and I can find where we agree, is where does uh, sex, in your opinion, and and gender begin and how do we recognize that because it's one thing to say i don't care what someone says they want to put on a dress and go in and call themselves nancy fine couldn't i think both of us agree couldn't care less but where does mm -hmm. sex stop and gender begin and how do we define that legally as to protect 
you know, the rights of everybody else who may not uh, agree with this and may express yeah. it through speech. Well, I don't think there should be, you know, punishments for misgendering unless it's being used in a way that is deliberately meant to harass or abuse someone. You know, an accidental misgendering someone or even if you just like can't get it right. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't think that that is a compelling uh, case for criminal activity. But in general, like if you're if it's part of a pattern of harassment and abuse toward someone, then that's a different context and a different story, you know? And I think that in general, people should just try to respect each other and just don't be an you know, just try to be kind to other people. And even if you don't understand why they have pronouns that are different or why they feel this way, just try to understand and be nice to other people, you know, and, and if it gets nasty, like, let's come back to our shared where, where we see things from eye to eye as human beings. I, I agree with being nice. Uh, absolutely. I think it's important if we're going to restructure society, how we view sex and, and genders, as you put it, like, differentiating between the two. Um, yeah. I think it's important that we don't completely restructure it and then say, by the way, if you weren't along for the ride, you're an if we're going to start fining businesses, if we're going sure, to start punishing yeah. people for speech. I think the onus is on people to say, gender is separate from biology, and this is why you have to go along with it. Otherwise, you know, we put you in jail or fine you. And I haven't heard a compelling argument for that. I think that's how foolish. Yeah, well, I don't, like I said, I don't think we should put people in jail or fine them for, for those sorts of things either. Um, but I just, I, 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 it depends on what laws, you know, it's hard to make general statements, but, you know, one of the ones that I, one of the debates that I find really interesting is about, you know, sex and sports. Like you mentioned before, um, you know, where trans women are playing uh, alongside cis women, people who were born biologically male mm-hmm. uh, before transitioning and, you know, the way that that affects your physicality. We know this is just, you know, basic biological facts that males are on average larger and males are on average have more muscle, whereas females have more fat and, you know, have different reproductive capacities. So, you know, that, those are the situations where I'm like, this is really rough because I don't, I don't think that we should, uh, I don't think that we should tell people who are what to be. But I also think that when it, there are some biological realities with sex mm-hmm. and those pose some difficult questions. And I think people need to be honest with themselves and with others about what's fair and what's not. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to get into a situation that disadvantages females who are smaller, you know, yeah. who have different athletic um, skills and different abilities yeah. because our bodies are a little bit different. I, I agree with you. Um, I think a challenge comes in there that a lot of people consider, as you've experienced now, consider that hate speech. Consider what you just said, foolish, and everyone is, yeah. is rushing with a legislative baton. So that's where it's important to determine where you are. If you, you draw the line at sports, some other people draw the lines at words. Um, yeah. Like the New York law, like we're talking about, uh, uh, or in Canada, which is so far gone. You know, free speech doesn't exist in any other country outside of the United States. So, um, right. and that's eroding here. So everyone has a line, right. and I guess I guess my sure. question is, how as society do we define that line? It seems like to you it's things that are physical, sports, but for well, I, yeah, because the 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 real tangible physical reality is sex. Yeah, you know, you have a penis, I have a vagina. Your body is different than my body, right? So that's just a physical reality. Now those realities can be shifted a little bit with various medical interventions, and I think that's what makes it difficult because you know somebody who is competing a trans woman who is competing again alongside cis women it's hard to say like to what extent a trans woman's body is just like a cis woman's body um with medical interventions and to what extent we see these uh differences just naturally amongst cisgender women anyway right like women are different sizes as well so where do you draw the line of like yeah, it's not, yeah, it's not I even mean, close. Testa- I agree I mean, with you. I yeah. agree with you. I'm just saying that there that these are like nuanced and difficult issues. If you want to be really logically consistent about it, right? And you want to say, like, well, this is the cutoff for size, 
well, what about when you have a female, you know, a, a woman who is born really big and, you know, you see a lot of athletes who are just like kind of anatomical and non- anomalies, yeah. basketball players and stuff like they're huge. They're not the average. This size, is where you know, not your average dude. Yeah. I think this is where generalizations are important um, and uh, and necessary. And I think, like you said, it's nuanced, but I, I don't hear a lot of solutions. This is coming from any, not yourself, I don't have, anyone in the even, world. I don't have solutions. I can't solve these problems. These are these are very difficult issues. I don't, I think don't so. have like some some agenda that I'm railing on. No, I know, I know you're not. Me. I'm saying I I do think there's only one solution. Just like when I talked, I've talked about abortion with other people. There's only one consistent line, like you said, to draw logically, and that sex is biological, and that's how we draw the line sociologically. The well, idea that gender sure, and well, sex are very different is a very new idea, right? I mean, it starts with you go back to Simone de Beauvoir in the in the 40s, and then you have John Money, and then really this idea that it was non-binary only started in the 80s and 90s with Judith Butler. Even people talking about transitioning. I know you've talked about this. Sure, Still, it was I identifying with male uh, or female. Um, yeah. So it's a very new idea, and we're restructuring that. everything on something that's just not, it's, it's not defined in science. It's modern gender theory. So it's reductive. Look, the solution you. is reductive. You're right. It's reductive. I hear you. No. I, hear you. I, think, I think that's a legitimate, it's a legitimate critique. I just, the, the, the problem that I come up against, um, I, I think I like agree with you in maybe more ways than you realize. Um, just that my concern is it's also important to me to make sure that the world is equally accessible to everybody, sure. you know, regardless of who they are or whether they experience dysphoria or not. Like it's important that, that everybody feel like they have the same opportunities to be able to pursue and, you know, the, the door is open to anyone and it shouldn't be closed just because you're trans. You know, mm. so with the sports stuff, what do you do? It, how do you solve that problem in a way that doesn't close the door to people who have a right to play sports and have a right to compete and be athletes and live their best lives? You know, that's where I get kind of tripped up is how to accommodate everybody at once. You can't. And actually, I would disagree with your, your statement. I would agree with everything except for one thing. You said it's important that everyone has uh the same accessibility, and I agree. Um, but then you said something which, which struck me. They feel as though they have equal opportunities. I disagree. They just need to be insured equal opportunities. And that solution's reductive. That's what I, I don't mean. care how they feel. Um, and where we're talking about the gender issue in sports, it doesn't matter how you feel. You do have the same opportunity. That's a great example. You have the opportunity to compete as a man, which is how you were born. You have the same opportunity as every other person who was born a man. But I feel like a woman. Well, it doesn't matter. You compete as a man. Equal opportunity there. It's reductive. It is simplistic, but it's it wasn't. We've created a problem now, and now people are trying yeah. to figure out how to solve it. There isn't a problem if you go by biology. Well, yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I, I I do get that. That's just like the simple point blank solution. But I'm not satisfied with this idea that people who are women should have to compete alongside men just because they were born male. You know, like I, I think when you understand, and I don't know how much exposure you have to real life trans people, right? Um, a who, lot. Yeah. Okay, so cool. So you probably are familiar with how she just doing simple can be. And I think if there is a way to make people's lives easier and to help them live the lives that they want to live, then we should do it. But I hear you in the sense that when it comes to like athletics or physical stuff really athletics is about your body yeah. and about your sex so but some people you know they they fully they transition and you know their their hormonal makeup does change you know particularly actually from female to male um because it is easier to trans it is easier to add testosterone than to take it away yeah. From, from a body. So, That's a good you know, point. or to certainly also, I would say to, I hate to, but we actually, Brian Shaw on the show is world's strongest man. So to certainly be, we, we'll talk, we talk about hormones a lot on the show. Uh, it's a lot easier to certainly change the effects than to eliminate the effects of an already testosterone laden body. You can't undo body. the yeah. bone density. I mean, you can, you can do cancer by injecting estrogen into a man, but you can't undo him 
becoming a man. And that's why right now, you know, we've hit the point with puberty blockers and children. And that's another question, which right. um, I'm against. But uh, yeah, yeah, I would agree with your statement there. Yeah. So it's tricky. I mean, I don't, I don't know. My, my mind is open to solutions that make everybody happy, but I don't feel like I've heard those solutions. And they don't exist. Maybe you're right. Maybe we need to like have more emphasis on sex or maybe, you know, something that um, someone had told me that I thought was an interesting idea is going based on your weight class or on your body composition so that people are being matched based on people that are like this, the same size as them. It doesn't matter. We already um, had that with wrestling and that guy just beat the sh out of a bunch of women in a Texas high school wrestling meet. So you, know, you have weight classes, but a, a male weight champ, there's never ever been in any physical combat, a, a male champion versus a female champion, the same weight. It's, it's not close and it's not fair to women. That's my point. It's not fair to yeah, women. Well, that's, that's where I agree with you is, you know, I don't want biological female people, whether they are women or men to be over. Yeah. Well, I, I, I appreciate your candor. I think, uh, I don't think there are solutions that please everybody. And I think the only consistent line is, uh, Maybe, is it, yes. is, is gender and sex, know. you know, are, are up until recently have long been considered the same thing. And these are complications now or nuances that are created in a way that can hurt people. Um, that's the issue very physically as we're talking about, but this kind of victim culture creates unintended real life victims. This happens all the time and there's no solution to please everybody. Um, so I think we both are on the side on many issues of, of freedom, uh, of speech and of expression uh, and, and not infringing on other people's rights. Um, I think you're, sh I think you're uh, in the right place on most of it. I just disagree with you on some of the issues. So your YouTube channel, we do have to get going. I know you're busy and uh, I am as well is Lacey Green TV. That's Lacey C I again for people listening and then go green 18 for as long as Twitter allows you to be on there who knows <laughs> yeah I don't really I haven't really been using social media much but yeah that's that is where I'm at and uh, I have a book coming out in September that goes into much more detail about these matters I would love to, I would love to read it and I'd love to have you back on to talk about it and you also have a patreon That'd by be the interesting. Way. I do I do yes <laughs> where is where is that for people to go? We'll bring it up in the lower third here. Uh, it's just Lacey Green, I think. Okay, yeah, there you go. Thanks, Lace. for the, thanks for the plug. Absolutely, Lacey Green. Uh, and she might have a bonus pretty soon where she'll be in a tub eating Cheerios. Yeah, hey, listen, that. <laughs> get your money's worth. Don't uh, hold me to that. Don't hold me to it. <laughs> I, I won't hold you to it, but I will picture it. Uh, Lacey Green, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And uh, I do hope to have you back, and I hope your book's a success. Thank you for taking the time. If you like the video, subscribe, watch one of these other videos, or hit the notification bell. Well, you should hit that if you subscribe anyways, because subscriptions don't mean anything on YouTube anymore. Now you have to hit notifications so that it shows up in your inbox, so I don't know why you subscribe in the first place, but that's what you have to do. Also, we're not making money off these videos anymore, because YouTube decided why, they, they just said we're not going to, and when we said why, they didn't tell us why exactly. Imagine if you showed up to your job, you did all your work, and then they said, hey, by the way, we're not going to pay you. You said why? They said, piss off!